Right, so hello and welcome everyone to the second installment of the CSR Research webinar series. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, so last time we were, we were, uh, we were listening to Dr. Gabriel Okello on e-mobility in Eastern Africa and this time we have Dr. Emma Garnett with us who will be talking us through understanding the environmental impacts of food and how to mitigate them. So Emma is one of CSL's Prince of Wales Fellows um, and the program and so I'm Dr. Jenna Hoon, a social scientist by training um, but I'm the program manager for research which means I work quite closely with Emma on delivering um, the research portfolio that we do have here in, in CSL that the program that Emma is part of is one of the flagship programs of CSL, trying to use research as a vehicle to address fundamental questions for the private sector to enable action on sustainability. So the work that we do is particularly focused on stakeholder engagement, but also on impact. So it is co-designed all the way through, and it actually looks at well, who, who is this work for? Who is the audience and what can people do about it? So in the case of Emma, before, um, she, before joining CSL, she was actually was completing a PhD at the Department of Zoology, here, with, here also in Cambridge, looking again at the impacts of food and diet and how we can actually reduce the carbon impact from that. So looking at the attendee, att attendees, I'm very excited to see like a wide range of people on this. We have particular, uh, particular of colleagues from the investment and banking sector on here. So the question might come up, why should finance be looking at food? So what is the relationship there? And to put it a little bit into perspective and context, and I think as Emma is going to mention, food is everywhere, but also food is a highly politicized area. It is highly emotional, but also affects everyone. But it's also part of a wider system. So thinking about, for example, consumer focused systems, food is one of them. So what is the role in revamping systems that are, that are centered around consumers? A huge chunk is consumer behavior and how consumer behavior can also drive demand. This is applicable not just within the food system, but I think we can also learn lessons from, for example, banking, for high street banking. What happens if people walk into a bank? How do you make that decision? What drives people to actually purchase something? And even all the way down to systems like transport, but I think that is only one element of to, to the work that Emma is doing. A second chunk of it is going into the, the deeper per content level is around food and the food system. So what is the future market here? What is it going to look like? And which criteria are we going to apply to what we will call a sustainable food system or even like a sustainable diet? And again, it is sort of the criteria that we're going to be talking about is kind of what makes a food company sustainable, for example is the fact that a company is just not serving meat enough to justify an investment? Or is it actually, do we have to take into consideration their packaging, their approach to, um, to sustainable agriculture, to production, land use, and also what is their relationship to biodiversity? So there's quite a lot of like, who are we going to, so who are going to be the producers of food in the future? But then also on the consumer spectrum and the intermediary, we have also some colleagues from supermarkets on the line, meaning who's going to decide what goes onto a shelf? So within a fast paced debate like sustainable diets, Emma's work is really key and core to helping us understand what are the environmental impacts of food and how, and how can we shape the system going forward. But without much further ado, I'm going to hand over, hand over Emma, who's going to talk us through it. And at the end of, uh, at the end of Emma's presentation, we're going to Take some questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to just pop them in the chat and we'll be addressing them um, after Emma's presentation. Emma, over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Gianna, for that fantastic summary of, uh, of this really interesting uh, topic area. Thank you, everyone, for joining this afternoon. My name is Dr. Emma Garnett, and my research focus during my PhD and during my fellowship is essentially around understanding the environmental impacts of food and how we can mitigate them. Ooh, apologies. 
there we go. Uh, so I think the first thing that's kind of worth talking about is that, you know, food is glorious, food is wonderful. And I think when we're thinking about climate and ecological emergencies, it can be quite easy to kind of feel despondent and uh, perhaps sort of pessimistic. But uh, here to kind of encourage everyone that healthy and sustainable diets can be kind of delicious and indulgent and really varied um, and wonderful. And these are just you know, some of the recipes from some of my favourite uh, food writers, uh, Jack Monroe, Mira Soda and Kate Taylor. So this is the good news. Unfortunately, the bad news is that um, producing food has transformed our planet arguably more than any other human activity. So food production is responsible for about a quarter, 26% of greenhouse gas emissions, about 38% of Earth's uh, ice-free land, and is responsible for about 70% of freshwater withdrawals. So you know, huge, huge environmental impacts and, and farming is also unfortunately a leading cause of biodiversity loss. Uh, for kind of a little bit of um, interaction, uh, I think Becca can now kind of launch a poll. Um, and so there's three different questions and so asking all of you on the on the call, uh, which has higher greenhouse gas emissions? So that's a like carbon footprint uh, per kilo. So chicken or cheese, chocolate or palm oil, strawberries or coffee. Becca, let me know when that's um, approximately finished. I'll give people about a minute. And Becca, am I able to see the results? Okay. Oh, and I'm thank you, seeing some results. So, uh, 23, 77% um, of people said cheese had the higher um, carbon footprint. And the second one, which is everyone, I can not see perhaps as much as you can. Right, and I think we're now onto the second one. So higher greenhouse gas uh, footprint, chocolate or palm oil. And 60% of people said palm oil. And now onto the third question. Oh dear. Um, which has the higher uh, greenhouse gas footprint, strawberries or coffee? And so the results from that third one, we will hopefully be finding out very soon. 65% of people said coffee had the highest carbon footprint. And just relaunching that. And right, so the majority of the audience got two out of three correct, um, which I'm very impressed with. So chicken or cheese, I think 77% of you um, correctly identified that. Cheese has higher greenhouse gas emissions. Chocolate or palm oil? So this is the one that um, uh, the only one that majority of people uh, were incorrect on. In fact, chocolate has higher greenhouse gas footprint than palm oil. Um, and strawberries or coffee, most people correctly identified, yes, it is coffee. 
And so I thought some of those were quite counterintuitive, but you are all clearly um, great experts on sustainable food um, and great job. So let's have a look at these in a little bit more detail. Uh, so at the top there, you can see um, highest carbon footprint. So this is per kilo. If you get per thousand calories, um, those comparisons stay the same, but the actual order of all six of them are a little bit different. Uh, so cheese and the highest there are quite a lot higher uh, greenhouse gas footprint per kilo than poultry meat quite near the bottom. <clears throat> Whereas, um, yeah, uh, chocolate or palm oil. In fact, um, and you can see in dark green there, these are the emissions, the amount of carbon going out into the atmosphere from land use. And even though because we're producing so much palm oil, in total palm oil is driving more deforestation than chocolate, if you're looking at a global level. But on a per kilo level, if you're buying um, a kilo of chocolate or a kilo of palm oil, uh, on average, that chocolate has driven a lot more greenhouse gas emissions from land use change, which uh, I think not many people are quite so familiar with. And uh, coffee or strawberries, even though um, berries and grapes are some of the highest emissions for fruit and vegetables, coffee is uh, much, much higher than those, which again, most people identify correctly. And great job. And though, of course, there's a lot of other environmental impacts to consider besides carbon footprint. It does correlate with a variety of others. I think some of the really interesting things that you can see here is that land use change and on farm emissions really dominate uh, products and carbon footprint. And you can see that you know processing in dark blue, transport in red, packaging in grey uh, are generally quite a much smaller component. Uh, the, one of the biggest ones for packaging, it turns out, is coffee. And I really recommend the Our World in Data Food Footprint Explorer. You can go and compare different foodstuffs by you know per kilo, per thousand calories, and see the different stages um, in the supply chain. I think one of the things that this really draws out um, is that you know in the UK, a recent study from just last year found many of our kind of less nutritious foods and drink account for nearly a quarter of diet-related greenhouse gas emissions, so things like cakes, but also drinks such as tea, coffee, and alcohol contribute about 15% of diet greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. And so this is this is perhaps one thing to consider that some things which used to be you know sort of luxuries that are now becoming kind of more daily um, almost essentials, perhaps um, the impact that they have on greenhouse gas emissions and also land use and deforestation and therefore impacts on biodiversity. I think one of the second things that Gianna alluded to as well um, when we're thinking about sustainable diets is reducing meat and dairy consumption and why is this important? So unfortunately, you know, livestock farming within food production is a leading cause of habitat loss, climate change and biodiversity loss. And there are um, two main principal reasons for this. Um, firstly, that it's inefficient to feed, for example, soy uh, to livestock and then to people. You might remember your biomass pyramids if you did um, GCSE biology. Um, as I did. And so you're losing kind of energy and materials as you go up um, the food chain. And then the second reason, uh, cows and sheep, um, so the ruminant animals, even though they can eat grass, which we can't eat, and that can be really useful in many parts of the world, um, they breathe out methane, they release methane as part of their digestive process, uh, which is a very, very powerful greenhouse gas, um, and also takes up a large amount of land that could otherwise uh, be sequestering more carbon or have more biodiversity. And then I think another fact which um, is important to consider, you know, food miles are only about 6% of a food's carbon footprint. And so when we're thinking about food, what you eat matters more than where it comes from. Now, I really want to emphasize transport, particularly transport of people, is an absolutely key sector for climate change. It has huge emissions, um, the fact, you know, planes and cars, and we need to be moving to, you know, more public transport and fewer trips where possible. That is really, really key. But actually within the food system, on-farm emissions dominate, food is generally transported, it, it's not very often transported by air, which is good news, it's by ship and by freight, by train, by lorry, which has lowish emissions sort of per, uh, per kilo of food. Now let's have a look at the carbon footprint of some protein-rich foods. So that previous slide had a whole lot of different foodstuffs. And one of the things I think becomes very apparent looking at this, you know, foods from cows, sheep, you know, and also prawns, um, very high emissions uh, per 100 grams of protein. And then in kind of intermediate, we've got kind of pigs, poultry and fish. And then at the bottom, sort of tofu, beans and nuts. And so I think two quite important issues is that the, there is a, you know, there's a wide variety. So if you look particularly at the top, like beef and beef, but also crustaceans, the lowest emitting foods, 
uh, in those little grey um, circles are much lower than kind of the 90th percentile. So this is, you know, the 10th best down to the 90th best or the sort of 10th worst. So you can see that spread there. Um, so there is that variation that is important. You know, not all cows are alike, not all um, eggs are alike. But even despite that spread, you can see that generally even the lowest emitting animal source foods tend to have higher emissions than the worst you know, tofu, nuts, groundnuts, pulses. So yes, there's that variation and there's still you know, quite a distinct separation between uh, protein rich plants and protein rich animals. And we see a similar but slightly different pattern if we're looking at the land footprint of protein rich foods. And so land and carbon is sort of very intertwined, not only through defore deforestation and kind of releasing carbon, but if we're thinking about nature positive businesses, the bigger the land footprint of your diet, the less land you have to restore nature or become nature positive. So if you're able to you know, feed people a nutritious and interesting diet on smaller areas of land, that frees up land you know, for nature, for biofuels, for sort of other uses. So thinking about land footprints, you know, how much land does a food take up? How much land does a fuel or you know, different um, materials, construction materials, fabrics, is a really, really important question. How much land, do, how much land does that take? Really, really key. And we can see at the top, again, cows and sheep, intermediate pigs, poultry, nuts, um, and actually fish have moved down to the bottom and surprisingly fish don't take up quite so much land, but we're seeing you know, uh, tofu and peas down there as well. Thinking about fish, um, unfortunately, you know, fish is a really, really important um, source of protein and micronutrients for many people, particularly um, in low income countries, uh, but often in the global north, it, where we're eating quite a lot of fish, um, this has led to overfishing of fish stocks. And the, so, um, within 2017, about 34% of stocks were overfished and 60% were fully fished, so maximally fished, and only 6% right at that bottom there were underfished. So we're running out of um, marine foods as well. And then another one, when we think about endangered species, often we think about you know, pandas or, or rhinos, but actually there's you know, endangered species that many of us in the UK still eat. So the Atlantic cod um, is listed by the IUCN Red List as vulnerable to extinction. That's the same as the African lion. And the European eel, which our local town of Ely is named for um, and people sort of still uh, eat, um, is critically endangered. And that's the same as a black rhino. So thinking about where we're sourcing fish from is also really, really key. And an unsurprising and perhaps a kind of less controversial one, you know, food waste, approximately a third of food worldwide is wasted, about 1.3 gigatons of edible food. And according to some estimates, if food wastage were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter behind China and the United States. Also, interestingly, if, you, if cows were a country, they also come into third place there. And now moving on to some more good news, <laughs> having uh, gone through a variety of bad news, is that healthy foods and sustainable diets do overlap to a broad extent. So processed and red meat, high levels of consumption of that have links with bowel cancer and heart disease. And the Department of Health recommends you know, less than 70 grams per day of processed and red meat, but a number of us in the UK eat quite a lot more than that. And to put that um, in perspective, so 70 grams is just one rasher of bacon and one sausage. So in this graphic uh, here, you can see as we go along from left to right, that's going from more healthy to less healthy. And as we go from bottom to top, uh, that's in a better for the environment to worse. So bottom left, we can see vegetables, fruits, whole grains and nuts. Top right, unprocessed red meat, processed red meat. And I think it is really important to point out some of the exceptions here. So you know, fish, um, moderately high environmental impact on average, but is beneficial for health. Sugar, sugar and sweetened beverages, low environmental impact, not so good for health. So there are some exceptions, but broadly healthy and sustainable diets overlap. And taking, uh, so I suppose, one thing away from this, you know, uh, having a look at the planetary health diet, if you haven't come across that. It's a really, really um, interesting uh, report and recommendations. They said, right, what does a global sustainable diet look like for 10 billion people, which is what we're projected to reach? And in short, unsurprisingly, you know, it's a lot. Um, it's a lot of nuts and beans and vegetables, and not so much meat and dairy. So per week, that's about half a kilo of beans and other legumes, quite a lot of nuts, about one and a half sausages worth of red meat, two small portions of chicken, um, two small portions of fish, and about the equivalent of about seven glasses of milk. And then going from per week, which I think is easier to visualise in some ways. 
scaling that up to per year, which is what the trade data is reported in. Let's say that's, a, that's about 15 and a half kilos of meat per person per year. And let's round that up to about 19, 20 kilos to account for food waste. And so how much meat do we eat? And in the UK, as you can see here, this map in kind of orange and red, a lot of the global north, including the UK, much, much higher than this 20 kilo um, recommended amount of meat. And globally from 1961 to 2017, uh, meat per person has almost doubled from about 23 kilos to 43. And our, uh, the human population has more than doubled from 3 billion to about 8 billion. So livestock production has, has quadrupled in that time, which unfortunately um, is not very sustainable. Right, so how could we change diets? How could we um, make diets you know, healthier, kind of more sustainable? Uh, so how do we mitigate these environmental impacts? And I think it's, uh, considering low versus high agency interventions, I think can be really, really, um, is really, really key. And there's this great figure from Adams et al, looking at increasing folate intake with two different approaches. So up at the top there, you can provide an information leaflet to try and get people to take folic acid supplements. But look at all those different stages that have to happen for that to work. The in, people have to obtain the information leaflet, they have to read it, they have to understand it, they then have to buy folic acid supplements and then they have to remember to take them. So that requires quite a lot of mental bandwidth and at each stage you're likely to be losing people who drop out along those chain of actions that are needed. Compare this to a low agency intervention which you know doesn't require much mental bandwidth, you can think of agency as amount of resources, effort, bandwidth. And here we've got folic acid added to wheat flour at the source, which is what we have um, in the UK. And to benefit from that intervention, all you have to do is continue to purchase wheat flour products and eat them, which is much easier. So I think when we're thinking about, right, how can we shift society um, to be more sustainable? How can we make it as easy as possible? And in a recent paper we published when we're thinking about how, can we, how could we change diets, thinking about these low agency interventions, I think you can broadly categorize things into the physical environment. So thinking about altering um, stores, cafeterias and restaurants, what we might call the micro physical environment, but also the macro physical environment, villages, towns and cities. And essentially it boils down to decreasing the opportunities to consume unsustainable food and increasing the opportunities to consume more sustainable food. And similarly with the economic environment, um, changing prices of different things. And yes, this can be through subsidies and taxes, um, you know, or other material incentives such as nectar points. And it doesn't always have to be at a government level. You know, uh, different businesses might have options on how they price different things. I realize, of course, there's constraints on that. And essentially, this boils down to that sustainable food options are the most affordable and less sustainable food options are the least affordable. So thinking about um, price and taxes and subsidies in a little bit more detail. So from a number of different um, surveys, we know that price is a really important influence on citizen food purchases. And there have been a number of different countries calls for sort of a meat tax or a carbon tax, but there are none currently in operation. I think what's really important to bear in mind is that subsidies dominate UK farming profits. So you can see in this graphic from the Financial Times, this is for all farming systems, you know, a number of the profits come from these direct payments. Uh, poultry is the least and lowland and upland grazing livestock are the most reliant on subsidies. And so we don't currently have a, you know, a free market situation that our food system is very much shaped by existing policies. It's not a kind of a natural or an inevitable consequence. Uh, it's very socially um, manufactured. Thinking about making sustainable options more available, um, the kind of easiest ones to do, and this is some research from um, my PhD. And we conducted a study in different college cafeterias um, and looked at these ones naturally varied, the number of total options and the vegetarian options served. So we're using vegetarian and vegan as a proxy for more sustainable, which uh, the data does bear out generally. And so, for example, Monday lunchtime, you can see if you've got three options and two are vegetarian and one's meat, we call that, you know, 67% vegetarian availability. If we're looking over at Wednesday lunchtime, we've got four total options, uh, two of which are vegetarian. And so that's a 50% vegetarian availability. And so we wanted to know, OK, right, what happens as you've got more vegetarian and vegan options and fewer meat options? Does that affect sales? Does that change citizen behaviour? And what we found was that, yes, it did. 
and that doubling vegetarian availability, so this is the axis along uh, the bottom there, going from 0 to 70, doubling that from 25% to 50%, so one in four options to two in four options, led to a 70% increase in vegetarian sales, and the sales that's on the y-axis going from the bottom to top there. And what we were particularly um, interested to find, and so looking at this graph on the far right-hand side, is that even meat lovers, so that's the people in the kind of dark, dark red who were able to identify from previous sales data, through to the most vegetarian diners, that's at the top in dark blue, so dividing people into four quarters, those four different lines, all four of them, all four groups, were more likely to pick a vegetarian option as more became available. So even meat lovers pick vegetarian options when there are plenty to choose from. Of course, Cambridge University students um, aren't representative of you know, the world or the UK as a whole. Uh, but this was quite a surprising finding. And we found that overall sales remain constant. So you know, build it and they will come, cook something tasty and people will eat it. It'd be one of the lessons from this. And thinking about this um, in a kind of real world example, um, so Cambridge University introduced a sustainable food policy. This was in 2016 from Nick and Paula White. And there are 14 different cafeterias across the university. However, this doesn't include the university colleges where a lot of students eat. And they had four main pillars for their sustainable food policy, which um, I've covered in this talk. So improving vegetarian and vegan choices and actively promoting them. So um, chefs learning how to cook um, a variety of different tasty options um, and put promotions within the cafeterias. Uh, they took beef and lamb off the menu entirely. Um, they were only serving sustainably sourced fish, and they really aimed at cutting food waste. And the sustainable food policy had a really remarkable impact, and I think being able to kind of measure this and sort of show what this business had achieved was really key for its um, impact and influence. And a colleague of mine compared March and May 2015 with March to May 2018 procurement, so before the policy and after the policy. And they found that the carbon and land footprint per kilo of food had decreased by about a third. So that's a huge, huge change in a really successful policy. And they also saw about a 2% increase in gross profits. And we were very excited to briefly be on the front page of BBC News, University of Cambridge, removing meat to cut carbon emissions. And uh, you know, Nick and Paula, you know, absolute trailblazers. And if you have a little Google for Earth Optimism, reducing an organization's footprint, I think hearing from Nick is, I, well, I find him just very inspiring every time I listen to him. I think that kind of operations perspective is so, so, so valuable. And I'm just gonna end with thinking about um, environmental footprint labels and foods. So talking about you know, one of the pieces of work I'm doing in this fellowship in a bit more detail. And currently carrying out a review thinking, right, because there's a lot of hype and interest in this at the moment. If we put um, a sustainability label, as an example there on the right, on every uh, food item in supermarkets, would that label, would that be enough to shift customer behaviour? Have nutrition labels been enough to shift customer behaviour? Might they influence retailer behaviour, what retailers are choosing to promote and to supply? And could environmental labels increase support for other policies to bring about more sustainable diets? So those are some of the questions um, I'll be thinking and writing about. And I will stop there. So there's plenty of time for questions. And yes, thank you very much, everyone, um, for coming. And yeah, I look forward to answering any questions incoming. <laughs>